So to be clear that on for you guys Thursday, for the other uh, for my last two classes Friday, you will have a test. It's a small test, but a test nonetheless. On chapter seven, cell structure. And function. You're expected to know the organelles and what they do. You're expected to know the cell membrane. and structure and function. And you're expected to know something about osmosis and diffusion. Only a little. Next week, we're going to get into some more complex situations. Honestly, I wish we would have done this two weeks ago. I feel like we're about two weeks behind what I would like to be. Still not bad. Just to, I, I feel like it was worth the time if it meant that you have some idea, a better idea of what's going on. I don't want to rush things. All right, so you need to know these things. You should have read Chapter 7 a week ago. You'll have this week. Uh, chapter 7 will be due this Thursday slash Friday. For you guys, it's Thursday. For my 6th and 7th group period, it is uh, Friday. So... Your notes on chapter seven, the, you have practice quiz questions you can do. I gave you Quizlet questions, you should know them. They have all the organelles, I gave you those two weeks ago. Told you to practice them, told you to read the chapter, take notes on it. If you haven't, well, you haven't. So as you're going through this next couple days, two or three days, you obviously need to really pay attention to cell membrane structure because you did this activity last week. I'm about to go over the answers today and tomorrow. And then a the little bit about diffusion that will, be, that will be on the test. So if you know your, you understand what each organelle does, you understand what it is and what they do, you should understand the types of cells, a little bit about the types of cells as well, So those are the things you should know and you should be able to do. I hope you're able to deal with that. Otherwise, uh, I'm not sure what to say about it, except that, you know, there'll be another test following that. I, I keep saying this to you guys that it all adds up. You will see it again. You will see this material again and again and again and again and again. We talked about covalent bonds a long time ago. I told you they're going to come up, didn't I? We talked about all the biomolecules and the elements of life. I told you they're going to come up. Well, the elements of life are going to show up again. The biomolecules are going to show up again. And again, and again, and again. So if you learned it the first time, and then you're developing. If not, you can catch up and learn it now. All right. Go ahead. Somebody else so has I want to be clear before, when before I say to this question. What is going on? Why is there... Breathes it's oxygen. Nice. Interesting. So if something yeah, breathes, oh. uh, doesn't breathe oxygen, doesn't breathe, is it alive? Bacteria does exchange gases. Some don't use oxygen, though. Yeah. Wouldn't they have to have some, some form of organs? Organs. So life has to have organs. Does that mean back, do bacteria have organs? Yeah. Uh, Say what? 
maintains homeostasis. That's that's a good one, isn't it? Yeah. Well, here's the trick. You're all right and you're all wrong. Uh, you, need, you need a little bit of everything to answer the question. I, it is mean, but I can't eat the cupcakes uh, cookies either. I'm diabetic. So if they're, if, if they're going to bring in cupcakes cookies and tell me, ah, you got cupcakes and cookies in the dining hall and I can't eat them, I'm going to tell you too. We suffer together. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. So life. We know life started... Yeah. Oh, it's not on the screen. Yeah, sorry. All right. So life started, as we said earlier, uh, life started around four billion years ago. There's a good, there's a much more accurate timeline present, but I don't have it. Oh, my thing ran out of juice and I didn't plug it in. Give me a second. All right. For, well, you know what? We'll just grade notebooks, start grading them tomorrow. We'll talk later today. We'll grade notebooks tomorrow. I'll start tomorrow. So it started about four billion years ago. And the question is, how did we get from this Soup is hot, bubbling. There's a lot of elect- uh, energy, high energy uh, solution. Soup. How do we go from that to the first life? And what did that first life look like? Yeah. Well, how do you grow? That's true. Both are true. They're, everything you're saying is not, is not wrong. But the question is, what do you need to do? If you're going to have life, what do you need to do in order to have life come from this non-living? What's the difference between living and non-living? And one of the things that someone said that was very telling, it's kind of a broad concept, but... You have to have something called homeostasis. You have to maintain order, maintaining status quo. There is a reality to the universe that's not very pleasant to think about, but the universe as a whole is moving is moving toward higher entropy you know this is chaos the the universe is moving towards chaos that is that is a uh, that is an observation that is undeniable. Everything in the universe moves towards chaos. Every, every reaction moves towards increased entropy. Yeah, that means randomness. Yeah, do you mind? Yeah, because I've always had this question about entropy. How does one measure it? That's a good question, but I'll have to get back to you on that. But we can talk during... It's, it's more complicated than it than I'd like to get to right now, but it's a good good question. Yeah? If we started from chaos and we're moving towards chaos, was there ever a time where everything was just like calm and peaceful? Like, was there ever a time where everything was just like calm? Yeah. Now. Now? You. You're it. Your life is the result of that. Life takes chaos and trades. It trades chaos and energy and it creates organization. So life is going against what the rest of the universe, how the rest of the universe is moving. So this soup is going, high energy going towards chaos. How do we, what's the first step to be able to maintain homeostasis? To find peace, as you say. 
to find order, really, is what we're talking about, order. Your body's constantly moving. It's working very hard to keep maintain this because its natural state, the natural state of the universe is complete chaos. What is it that uh, in some old texts, uh, in some texts of some Bible says, they say ashes to ashes and dust to dust? Mm-hmm. Or dust to dust and ashes to ashes? I don't remember which one. Like, uh, we all came from dust and we shall return. Yeah, we, we came from dust and to dust we shall return or something like that. That's actually very true. We came, all things came from dust. We, life, I say we, I mean life. The plants outside, the bacteria, all life does is take the dust, the chaos, and create order. That's it. So how do you do that? How do you create homeostasis? How do you create order from this soup? So you got this soup of a bunch of different little things. And how do you take this and put order to it? What do you need to do? Uh, this is going to be very broad. Organization. Yeah, organization, but you can't. Or, all right, so let me ask you a different way. You, got, you have a room. Have you ever been to your sister's room? Sorry, ladies, but this is my experience with my sister. Definitely. Have you ever been to your sister's room? Definitely. Those of you that have boys, I have girls, so I have sisters. Even if you have, even if you yourself are not this way, ladies, if you are, I, I say sisters, boys are the same. It's just, I think what happens with boys, I know my experience, there were four of us, uh, four boys and one girl in my family, and all the boys, we just, I don't know if it's, we just didn't care enough to switch our, change our clothes every day multiple times, or we just didn't, I don't remember if we even bathed every day, I can't remember. But, I mean, boys can be a little grody, that's the truth. But my sister's room, I'm telling you, was complete and utter chaos. All the clothes were on the floor. It was literally knee deep in clothes. She, put, she used to put a sign on the door that said, do not enter. This means you and, you know, she, and us. Of course, what did we do? We went in because of the sign. So, to, yeah, don't ever tell me no because I'll just say, oh, okay. <laughs> so I'll be right there. So, anyways... It, my mother would go insane and tell her to clean the room. What did she have to do to organize the room? Pick it up. Organize it. All right, pick it up. She did. She spent hours. She spent hours. What, did you, what do you have to do? She put it into closets. What she did, she shoved it all into a closet. First of all, I, I just want to say one thing. That's a really good example. And, and Willie is kind of crazy that you said that because that's exactly what she did. She literally put all the clothes in, just do them all in the closet so she can go out with her friends. And my mom opened the closet and all the clothes fell on her. On her? On her. She was not a happy camper. So, but interestingly, interestingly, putting all the clothes in a closet, lift your head up and, par- and participate in the, in the discussion. Hello, if you're sick, go to the rest, go to the office, sign in, please. Somebody tap her on her shoulder and let her know she needs to lift her head up. Take notes. Up, head up. Take notes. What do you say? Bathroom, go. Sign out. So, putting all those clothes in the closet was creating order. It was going to be allow her to, to maintain homeostasis. She had to put everything in the closet. Of course, that wasn't my mother's idea of cleaning or organizing. What's a better way of organizing? Who has a better way of organizing? Yeah. Yeah. A specific set of... Or, uh, of okay, and where would you... And, and put them in the closet again? Wash and fold them, then what? What? So put them in different, in, in where? Put them away where? Where's that? In the drawer? In different drawers. That's what I was getting to. And look, think about this, guys. I'm not, t- I'm just not telling you a story. I'm trying to get you to imagine what's going on here. This is not me wasting time. It's me trying to get to the essential pieces and parts of what life is. Hear me. You're taking those clothes, washing them, drying them, doing all kinds of actions with them, folding them, and putting them in drawers rather than all in one closet. Is that where they came from? Well, 
they came from the fact the store, but that's another story. So you put them in drawers. What is the difference between shoving them all into one closet versus putting them all away in different drawers? Compartmentalization. Compartmentalization. Correct? Yeah. That's it. The word is compart. Compartmentalization. Notice I spelled that correctly. And look how long. Now watch, watch. I'm going to misspell the. I'm going to put T-E-H. I don't know why. I, I, I don't know if I'm slightly dyslexic. I have no idea, but I do it all the time. It really annoys me that I do it. I like do it, and then I'm like, why did I do it again? That, the reason that's easy for me to spell is it's spelled the way it sounds. In Spanish, we spell, we spell the way it sounds. In English, you don't, because it comes from so many different languages. So it's actually very difficult to remember how to spell words in English. So anyways, compartmentalization is the key. Taking and creating, what is a compartment? It, it, is, it is storage, but what's, when we talk about compartments, that's what this is. It's the compartmentalization is the creation of compartments, all right? So the question, I guess, uh, goes back again. We have this soup. How do we create order from disorder? So you got this giant soup full of a bunch of different things, and you want order, and there's just this chaos of moving particles. How do we create order? We have to create what? What do we call a compartment? Today we call, today. yes, in the case of our example, they were drawers. But in the case of life, what is the, com the compartment called? The cell. The cell is the compartment. It allows you to organize material. Allows you to stop the chaos, to fight against the ultimate disorder. You should be writing this down and drawing it, not staring off into space and rubbing your eyes. I'm just saying. It's going to be tough for you to do well. The cell. The cell is key. So in compartmentalizations, the creating of, of spaces, the create. The creation, why? This thing, I don't understand. Compartmentalization is the creation, wow. The pencil just stops working, I don't know why. I don't see how, it says, it's connected. Oh, it's 0%. That's why. Yeah, it's called my finger. All right. So the, the creation of space. Spaces, right? Drawers are spaces where you can put your socks in one, your underwear in the other, and your, t -sh and your shirts in the third, etc. Right? So a closet which is my sister's first solution to her space, to her organization problem, what is a space. It did work. It just wasn't as well organized. There was a temp, for her, it was just trying to get out of the house so she can go with her friends. But, it's, uh, but it didn't work. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work as well as putting it in drawers. Does everybody agree? It's more organized to put things in drawers. So... It turns out that that's how life is as well. The first life was likely a single cell. Uh, it's something called an archae, archaea, bacteria. bacteria. It is something also known as a prokaryote. Uh, now, people, some people spell it with a C, but okay. Prokaryote. 
There's no, only one membrane in a prokaryote. One membrane. So that's it. And then inside does have DNA. This is a mistake that a lot of kids make, that there's no DNA in, in bacteria. They do, have, they do have DNA. It's circular. Circular DNA. We call these plasmids. Uh, well, the circular chromosome. And then they also have tiny little little circular uh, pieces of DNA. I call them pieces, whatever. These are called plasmids. Sorry, I can't write neatly with my finger. Let me try again. So one circular DNA, and they have one big circular chromosomal chromosome, and then a bunch of little plasmids. Yeah. What exactly are plasmids? Just small circular DNA instead of the big one. There's a big circular DNA. That's the the bacteria's chromosome, and then you have tiny little ones that are just circular DNA. And then they have all the other stuff. So they just created a, the first cell was just this soup within a soup, right? Yeah. This little room, and inside it. We call it the room, by the way, the room cell means a room. When you go to prison, you go into a what? A cell. That's a room. All right. So a cell is a room. And what you do is you create a, a that created the course that someone said earlier, they have to multiply. Why are you listening? Why do you have those in your ears? Why do you have those in your ears then? I don't understand. I don't get it. But whatever. So, my, so prokaryotes are a single room, single space, like my sister's closet shoving things in. And that's fine. It worked. In fact, it worked really well. This one cell became uh, prolific on planet Earth early on. And... From north to south pole, this single cell covered the planet. In the, it was a liquid at the time, or a lot, a lot of liquid water. It was a soup. The thing is, it wasn't green. They didn't do photosynthesis the way we do it today. Lift your head up. They didn't have the ability to make chlorophyll, which is what makes plants green. Lift your head up. They did a different process. We still have some of these bacteria around today. We know they're purple in color. So the planet was likely, if you look down on it from, from, the, from space, it would look purple because all the oceans would have been purple because this bacteria was purple. It did use the sun. It did photosynthesize. It just didn't do it the way our, we, our plants and other photosynthetic organisms do it today. They still photosynthesize using these pig... These, pur these purple colored pigments, yeah. So was, sorry, so was the world like, was well, was anything alive? Let's answer the last question. Yeah. yeah, what was alive? The bacteria. So it wasn't, it wasn't toxic to the bacteria. Could we have lived back then? No, because there's something else that was missing, oxygen. There was no, very, no, no free oxygen. There was nothing, there's no O2 gas. All the oxygen was trapped. So was it clean? Huh? No, I don't know what you mean by clean. It was, it was, it was great for the photosynthesizing bacteria, that, for the purple bacteria. It was great. They were happy. But then came along another bacteria. And it was able to take a, a part of another part of well it, in order to understand evolution you have to understand DNA we haven't gotten there yet so no they didn't just show up what, what they did is they evolved 
So the DNA from this bacteria, there was one of its children, one of its children had a mutation to the, to the chromosome that produced a protein that allowed it to do, to take advantage of a different part of the light spectrum, which made it look green. We, uh, we call these today cyanobacteria. Yeah. What does like the G beside O2 stand for again? Gas. Sorry about the messy writing, but I'm going to have to let it go. Cyanobacteria is around today. They are single celled organisms that do photosynthesis, they are green. They did photosynthesis better. There was a competition. Do you see here in the plants that you're growing? You see there's competition. The little ones are competing against the big ones. Only the, be only the fittest will survive. So here there was a competition between the purple and the green. The green, the green did it better. So the green took over the planet. There's still some purple left, purple bacteria left in different places. We, I, I'll show you if you like. Yeah. What dictates mutation? It's a really good question. We'll get into it. But to be, to be clear, I'll outline it for you. Number one, mutations happen all the time. That's, that's not, it's a natural course of doing DNA replication, copying DNA. Secondly, you can increase mutation by... You, uh, by exposure to UV light, uh, certain chemicals, they can increase mutation rates. And certain places in your DNA, in the DNA, are more apt to mutate than others. So all those things influence mutations. So cyanobacteria outcompeted, and they, these guys right here changed planet Earth. They freed up the oxygen, which allowed all the rest of us to be here. Not just them, but the plants that came after them. And obviously, the, it, the least of it is that the, the earth went from purple to green. Green and blue now, because the blue is another story. But the atmosphere changed. These little tiny singles. Remember what I told you about small things making a difference when there's a lot of them? These, these microscopic organisms, single-celled organisms change the planet. For the better, for as far as we're concerned, yeah. Yes, question, answer. Um, so in theory, all life on Earth evolved from cyanobacteria and um, the uh, purple one. Uh, correct, correct. These were the first, and that is the theory. And I'll show you the evidence uh, tomorrow. Yeah. It depends on, your, on what you believe each to, to mean. There's that word that some, uh, if, you read, if you read it, imagine your bedroom without closets, drawers, shelves, boxes, or just uh, a room in, with a bed. Where, you would, uh, where would your stuff be? You'd be able to find things needed. How efficiently could you get ready for school in the morning, would all your school items be set in this study? The compartments you use in your room, the closet drawers, et cetera, help you organize items in a category so that you can get dressed in one place. All the items you need for studying are in another place. The compartmentalization improves efficiency. Cells also need organization to improve efficiency. Cells need organization to improve efficiency. Compartmentalization is achieved by dividing up areas in the cell with membranes. Plasma membranes. Plasma membranes compartmentalize internal structures while the cell membrane acts as a boundary between the cell and between the cell and external environment. And three, if I were gonna read that, as I'm assuming you all did. 
then I would have I made sure I knew one, two, three, four facts before I moved on. And by the way, that is life. I would have expected somebody to say cell membrane, cell, cell. All right. So let's take a look at these major components. The first component you see here is this, this polar head, which includes a phosphate. Now, under normal circumstances, when you see them drawn, what you'll see is a circle with a phosphate, uh, with a phosphate in it, and that's kind of the phosphate head. And then you'll see this kind of zigzaggy line. This represents this line here, this zigzag of carbons and hydrogens. That's why they draw it this way. This is known as a what? What is this part known as? A fatty acid is correct. There are two kinds of fatty acids, as you know, and before we go on, let's talk, because you guys had an FRQ that should have been done by now. Hopefully it has been uh, and turned in. A fatty acid has a C uh, double bond O, single bond OH at the beginning, and, one, and then there's, from there, there's an alternating carbon, two hydrogens, carbon, two hydrogens, etc. And we said when we put these together, there's this molecule called glycerol, which is three carbons and then hydroxides off of each one. We call this glycerol. And by the way, where is the glycerol in this drawing? It's right here, oops. This is the glycerol, three carbons. And you take a fatty acid head, which is a C, oops, C, which is a C, let me do it in the white, not blue. C, and I think it's, as I said, double bond O, O, H. And then you have the little wiggly uh, alternating carbon hydrogen bonds. And you're going to get these to bond to something. You're going to get it to bond to phosphate. There's a, this first one is going to bond to phosphate. So I'm going to flip this just because I don't want to put it on the same side as the fatty acids. But what happens is that you have the OH and here you have a, P O H, so phosphate. This connects to some other part you can look at later. I don't. That's not really the important issue here. What happens is what comes out when you link these two together. What comes out? Water. So hydroxide and hydrogen leave in the form of water. And together you link them into a phosphate, dehydration synthesis. So you see that phosphate was, it, it's also connected to this other molecule here that has nitrogen in it, but whatever. This whole thing here is connected to this carbon through dehydration synthesis. Again, your FRQ re requested that you drew that. The second, the second thing, the second carbon is connected to fatty acid here again, you're going to take this fatty acid. So this, I'm going to, uh, let me erase this other mess that's up here. So one side, you have the phosphate connected to it. And again, the phosphate has this, these other structures connected to it as well. But we're not going to worry about that. We're just going to kind of call it a phosphate head. And then down here, these two, these two fatty acids, one with a single bond, which we call what? What do we call the single bonded ones? Uh, that's right, they're saturated. 
And then one that's uh, uh, in the drawing, one of them, one of them is what? Not saturated, but what? Unsaturated. Unsaturated is correct. So it has, it has a, a double bond, which makes it kink out to the side. Again, just a kind of a scribble there on the on the drawing. What happens when you combine, how do you combine these? How do you make them into a structure? Dehydration synthesis. Dehydration synthesis so, oops. So this hydrogen and this OH leave in the form of water to make room for the bonds. And then this other OH, this other group also leaves in the form of water. And together they bond into a molecule. This molecule is known, and there it is. This is what it looks like neatly drawn. You can see the O that used to be an OH. This had an OH group on it. Water came out. That's now connected to the double bond O. And there's your, your saturated chain of carbon and hydrogen. The same thing happened to this middle carbon. And there's your unsaturated, there's your double bond. Your unsaturated double bond. Which kinks, you see how it kinks it out? Kicks it out like that? That's gonna be important for membrane structure, this kink, this unsaturated fatty acid. All right, let's go to that in the next. That's all before we even get to the first page of the questions. Refer to model one, at least two organic functional groups in a phospholipid molecule. Well, we've already, we've already listed uh, carboxyl and hydroxide. Anybody have another answer? Uh, glycerol is another one, yeah. Yeah, and amine, that was there as well. Is it time to go? Is that why people are pegging them? No, okay. So amine, carboxyl, hydroxide, which one? Phosphate. The, yes, phosphate is there, but unfortunately it says this. And when you look at a phosphate, it's just phosphorus with four oxygens. We call this inorganic. Yeah. Yeah, it's out uh, behind me. Inorganic. It's it's the phosphate that makes up your DNA, that makes up your RNA, comes from rocks. They're inorganic. They're minerals in the in the soil. Very hard. There's a whole phosphate cycle. How how that replenishes itself. Phosphate is very difficult to come by. That's why we have, to, we have to process it and we use chemical fertilizers to fertilize our fields in part because of phosphate. So it's inorganic. It's phosphorus with four oxygens attached to it. So, yeah, but that was good. Phosphate is a, is a functional group. Absolutely important, but it's just not organic. Consider the term phospholipid. What portion of the molecule in model one is responsible for the phospho part? Phosphate, that's easy. What portion of the molecule in model one is responsible for the lipid part? The two fatty acids. What part of the phospholipid is polar? Circle the, uh, the molecule that is polar, it's the head. So if you're gonna draw it, it would be, I would, I would circle this head as the polar head. Which portion of phospholipid will mix well with water? Which will mix well with water? Which is going to be soluble in water easily? The head. The hydrophilic. the hydrophilic, which is not a lipid. Remember, lipids or fats don't mix well with water. So this is hydrophilic. 
This is these this tail are hydrophobic. These are water loving. They mix well with water. So these are water loving. This is water hating. So one side's water loving, the other side's love water hating. The heads love water. Explain your reasoning. Like dissolves like. Let me write smaller. Okay, this program is starting to freak out again. Okay, it's too small. Wow. I might have to do something about this. One update, one update is all it takes to, to make everything, I mean. So, like dissolves like, the... Okay, just say what you're trying to say. This is very frustrating, it's all. So the, you're going to have to write it down then without me having to write it down. That's all there is to it. I can't. So the like dissolves like, so the hydrophilic head being polar associates with polar, the polar water very well. The hydrophobic head being not, uh, the, the, the fatty acids being nonpolar do not mix well with the polar water. So because of like dissolves like, in short. Draw a square around the portion of the molecule that's nonpolar. We already I kind of drew it out there, but I'll I'll try to draw it here. Would this portion of the phospholipid mix well with water? No, we just explained it. Like dissolves like again. The nonpolar material that does not interact well with polar material. The polar water molecules interact with each other very well. Pretty much snob, uh, snubbing the hydrophilic part. It's less of repulsion and more of the water molecules attract each other better than, the, than they have an interaction with the nonpolar materials. So label the regions of the molecule of phrases hydrophilic and hydrophobic. We did that. I can put a little heart on it. Try to draw a cross and skull bone, uh, but nothing was working. Scientists often use a cartoon representation. Again, this is the cartoon representation. I just kind of do, did it up there. Like the ones shown below to represent hydro, uh, phospholipids. Which portion of the cartoon represents the hydrophilic head? Well, I think that it's in the name, but okay. Wow. Son of a gun. The hydrophilic head, and then there's the hydrophobic tails. So that, that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with it. When you see these drawings, that's what you should be thinking about. So if you were asked to draw, which is what you're asked, and you have this, let me draw it again. There's, you have the hydrophobic tail and the hydrophilic water, uh, or the phosphate head. What's going to happen? How are they going to put themselves? You have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. How would they, 
how would they uh, align themselves on, if you put them in water? You know they're not going to mix because the lipid tails won't mix. So how do you get them? Yeah. Wouldn't it like just be the hydrophilic heads in the water and the tails? That's right. That's it. The only the, all you have all you have to worry about is that you have this head these heads in oh I should put them in the water I suppose. I wonder if I zoom in, will it work? The hydro, three hydrophilic heads in the water, and then the, the two tails sticking out. And that's what would happen if you put, and that's what happens, you get this layer of, when you see oil floating on water, the oil would sit at the top, like the yellow tails are but the head stick in the water and when you have phospholipids. Not all, not all lipids have a phosphate head. This is a specific type of lipid. All right, so when the amount of oil is, uh, when a small amount of oil is added to the beaker, the water containing phospholipids uh, will surround the oil droplets forming micelles. And I would, I would jump right to micelles in the previous video. So uh, use several cartoon representations and phospholipid molecules to show the orientation of the phospholipids in a micelle. So let's think about this. By the way, this is how detergent works. The detergent that you use to get oil stains out of your shirts and you put in your dish uh, your your uh, your washing machine this is how it works so you got oil it's in water you know oil is not going to mix with water but will oil mix with the lipid parts yes. yes it will so what will happen is you'll get the phospho the phospholipid heads surrounding They'll, they'll interact with each other, no problem. They'll interact with water, no problem. They just don't like oil, so they point away from oil. The tails love oil. Tails have no problem with oil. They're, they are hydrophobic themselves, so they have no problem pointing towards the oil. And they form this, this little hydrophobic chamber, if you will, hydrophobic cell. It's not tr a true cell, and you'll see why in a minute. And you should have already because you should have did yesterday's work. So, and then in the center, you have the oil. This, does, this happens all by itself because water, the water molecules out here, the water molecules out here uh, love each other. Of course, they're polar, and they love the, uh, the phosphate heads. But they don't really, they kind of reject the, the, the oil, all right? So you have this thing. It's called a micelle. And it's, it's written right here. Let me, let me be clear that it is here. It says micelle. And it's M-I-C-E-L-L-E-S. I'm just a micelle, not S. So my cell, notice it's spelled differently, and notice it's not as simple as C-E-L-L. -L. Yeah? What would a broader definition of my cell be? A single layer of phospholipids surround, uh, creating a hydrophobic center, with a hydrophobic center. That's, that's it. That's all it is. It's a ball of lipids. Yeah. For what? Oh, over there. Over there. There should be plenty of extra. So it's a micelle. It's not a cell. But this is what happens when you have, if you have a t-shirt or a shirt of some kind. Yeah. My wife would kill me that I can't draw this. I guess that's fine. If you get, if you're eating some, I don't know, eat what, what do you eat that's greasy? French fries or something, and you get some oil on your shirt, and it's your favorite shirt, you quickly add detergent to it, and detergent is just a phospholipid of some sort. 
It's a polar head. Each detergent has its own formula and a hydrophobic tail. When you add it to the stain and then you throw it in a washing machine, which is full of what? Water. The micelle, the, the lipid gets surrounded by, the oil gets surrounded by the phospholipids and then gets washed away, drained away out of the washing machine. That's how detergent works creates this micelle. This is three-dimensional. I'm drawing it in two dimensions, but you have to imagine that you have like a, literally a, a ball, a ball of, of heads in three dimensions surrounding the oil. This is a cutaway. So if you imagine you cut this, you cut this, this ball in half and you look inside like cutting an orange or something. Uh, what you'll see is inside there is what is it now another bee it's probably the, literally the same bee I, it can't be though there must be a hole somewhere in the window it's just a bumblebee leave it alone you're freaking out and you're not focused on the Yes, go ahead. So three dimensions. So you have three dimensions. So there's the bless you, there's depth. It's a ball of fat on where where the lip the hydrophilic heads on the outside, the hydrophobic center is in the middle. And it gets washed away. Of course, this is at the molecular at the molecular level. All right. So recalling the, the, so what would I expect to see if I were grading this? I'd expect to see a micelle that looks something like this, maybe a three-dimensional piece and a labeled, you know, hydrophobic, hydrophilic tail. I wouldn't expect a t-shirt example, but that's fine. Recalling the beaker of water is three-dimensional. What is a three-dimensional shape of the micelle? Well, I literally just, I didn't even know that was the end question, but there it is. All right, so it's a ball. So it forms a ball. Is that okay with everybody? Everybody understands that? Because there's water surrounding it. The hydrophilic heads are gonna get, are gonna go all the way around and the hydrophobic tails are gonna go in the center. So there it is. That's, uh, we're good with this page. Also reasonable, I think you could have answered those. Maybe you didn't. Now you did. Now you're gonna upload the final answer. They're over there. There's literally, there are. I promise you, maybe they're there. Maybe they're over here. Maybe you can go make copies, but I swear to you, there's extra copies in that. Did you check behind the plants? Okay, because I'm telling you there were at least 10 extras. I don't know. I, I printed 150 of them. I only got 120 kids. Are you guys eating it or something? Yeah, there's a... Uh, the top, the front is not the bat, not the rest of it. I'm sorry, I don't have, I, I just don't have it right now. If it's not here, it should be extra copies. There were plenty printed. All right, all right. So when we're looking at this, and again, just to be clear, the difference between when we look at this and you see this one, this has a, this has a, uh, a hydrophilic, a hydro. Oh, I see. A hydrophilic outside, the heads are facing out, and then you have the hydrophobic inside here, the faces inside, and in the very center, you're gonna have oil. Outside, you have to have water. That's when this happens, as we looked at in the previous slide. When would, th that's number one. Number two would happen when you have oil on the outside, oil on the outside, but on the inside you would have water because the hydrophilic heads are pointing inward, you'd expect to find water on the inside and outside you'd have oil. That's in the second situation. In the third situation, what you'd expect to see is water on the inside and water on the outside. 
And if you and what again? Why? Why do I know that? Because you can see the hydrophilic heads. They're on the surface, right? They're, what? Are, what's the hydrophilic heads going to be pointing to? The water. They have to be pointing to its water, because if it was oil, they would be repelled by it. They wouldn't form an organized structure. And so when we look at here at the inside, we'd also see water because the hydrophilic heads are pointing in. And in between, you have two layers, two layers of fatty acid tails of lipids, right? So we have phosphate heads and lipid tails, two layers of them where the lipid tails dissolve each other. We call this, we call this a phospholipid by layer. Two layers. Phospholipid by layer. Everybody okay with that? All right. So the example, and that's what a cell membrane is. A cell. If you've done your work, if you, if you did your work yesterday, if you've read your chapter, you know you have a cell that has a cell membrane. And right now, I'm going to look at just a prokaryote. What is a prokaryote? Just a single cell membrane. No internal membrane, so we'll look at that in a minute. But if we took a close look at the cell membrane, what we find in a cell is inside there's water. Outside there's what? Water. I hope everybody realizes that now. If you didn't before, I hope you realize it now. So that means there has to be hydrophilic heads pointing inside and hydrophilic heads pointing outside. And then in the center, there has to be hydrophobic tails. There has to be, because you have water inside and outside, because as one of your colleagues just said a little earlier, if like dissolves like, how is it possible that you could form a membrane if the lipid tails are repelled by water? Well, it's the hydrophobic heads that, that point towards the water that allow that this membrane to exist. Yes? So that white line is the cell membrane? Is the cell membrane, yeah. It's the cell membrane. I, I just drew it in yellow just to show you the different colors. But yeah, that would be called the cell membrane. That's one name of it. That's one version of it. Another, another name for the cell membrane is called the plasma membrane. Another word for it an, or, or term that represents it is a phospholipid. by layer. Now, I have to say that this is a phospholipid by layer. This is a cell membrane. In a prokaryote, that's the only membrane it has. Yes, question. So, the part where the tails are, what's inside there? There's no, it's the, the tails. The tails are in there. But that's a good question. That brings us to what else is in that membrane. So that's going to be an investigation we're going to look at later. But just to give you a clue, you have the hydrophilic heads on one side, hydrophilic heads on another. And we'll talk more about this tomorrow since we're not having the test. And we'll, you see that they, what you have on the inside of the membrane is what? You have these, the lipids. Now, what else might you have in there? You could have this, this multi this I'm just I don't know what I don't know how to draw it but we'll just go ahead and draw it like this this thing known as cholesterol you've heard of this yes cholesterol oh is it frozen oh, this is really I'm gonna have to buy a new app because this app is just it's not playing easy not playing well with the new 
Somebody say something to me? Yeah, no, it came off because I, I turned it off. I had to turn it off and turn it on. So the, fo the phospholipid bilayer, in the phospholipid bilayer, you can have, is it recording? Yeah. In the phospholipid bilayer, you can have uh, cholesterol. In fact, you do. And in animals, cholesterol, by the way, cholesterol is only found in animals. So that's something that when people tell you no cholesterol-free sunflower oil, all plant oil has no cholesterol. Cholesterol is not found in plants, only in animals. Cholesterol helps keep the membrane fluid. Does everybody know what, a, what fluid means? Can someone tell me what fluid means? Good. To flow. Who said that? To flow. That's right. That's intuitive. Very nice. Help, well, let's, before we get to that, do you know what fluid means? So fluid means to flow. What kinds of things flow? Who can tell me? Blood. Liquids for sure. Blood is an example. Correct. So liquids for sure flow. What else flows? It's not just liquids, though. Gases, yeah. Gases flow. If, if, if with liquids, you know they flow because you've seen rivers flow, right? Or creeks, or a stream, or water going into the sewer. How do you know gases flow? Wind, wind, yeah, wind. You can feel the flow. When you stand in the wind, it's like standing in a in a, in a creek. It's the flow of of the gas going across your body. It's flowing. It's a fluid. So the membrane needs to be fluid. It needs to be able to change and move. It's constantly moving. And this is a fluid. It has, even though it's not water, it's a fluid. It's, it's, they stick together because of the interactions between the, the bilayer and the interactions, uh, or rather the lipid, the hydrophobic interactions here and the hydrophilic interactions here. They stick, these stick together. The polar molecules stick together, correct? And the nonpolar molecules stick together. So the membrane holds itself together that way. That's an answer for, on that handout, by the way. One of the questions on the handout is how does a cell membrane hold together? How does a my cell hold together? You should be answering that. So this is, you can almost consider these as guided notes for you. So the, the, the hydrophobic interactions keep the hydrophobic part of the tails together. The hydrophilic interactions keep the, hydro, uh, the hydrophilic heads together. So that's how membranes stick together. That's how you, your cells, you're made of cells. Why, why don't they just fall apart? Because they're being held together by those tiny little interactions between the molecules. Now, what happens when it gets cold out? What do, what do fluids do when, they get cold, when it gets cold out? They, come they freeze. They come together too closely. And once they come together too closely, they become a solid. We don't want to become solid, do we? So what animals do is they add this cholesterol molecule to the membrane. And they also add, another thing they do is they'll add a, an unsaturated fatty acid. So if the more unsaturated fatty acids you have, the more space that there is in between the molecules. Does that make sense? So that pushes the other phospholipids away. So in, this, in the winter, what you're going to find is more unsaturated fatty acids and more cholesterol in animal membranes than you would in the summer so that the membranes are less dense. This is an exaggeration, okay, just to make a point. You get more space in between the molecules, so when they start to slow down, they don't freeze into a solid. They, they act almost as an antifreeze. Yeah. Is that, is, that, is that why like, the skin has That's a really good question. Uh, why is the skin dry in the winter? No, this, that is not why, but it's a, really good, it's a really good observation, okay? I just want to point that out. The reason your skin gets dry is because the air is drier and more water leaves your skin, so you're, literally your skin gets drier. That's why putting 
uh, waxy coatings like lotion on your skin stops your, your skin from, from get drying out. Okay? Then, so that is different. Yeah. If you went to the doctor like in December and then went back in like April or like towards the summer and they took like samples of your blood each time, would they look different since you said something about um, that? <laughs> then you make me almost want to cry how beautiful a question that is. That really is a beautiful question. I want to point that out. I know you all get think beautiful is, you know, all these styling things you all do, which you are, are very beautiful. But for me, those kinds of questions, the kind of questions you two just asked and observations you're making, it just shows how beautiful your minds are. Okay, just amazing. Absolutely right. So when you take blood samples, when you take a blood sample, the conditions under which you take them can influence the results. So humans, we don't live in the cold. We're not, right? In the wintertime, you're not out there, are you? You're in the house. You're, 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 run, you're walking around. Uh, you put coats on. So you don't let, your body doesn't react as intensely as like a rabbit that's living outside trying to forage for food in the middle of winter, correct? So they need to keep their blood a lot more with a, their cholesterol and their blood samples is probably going to be much higher than yours might change in the winter versus summer. But yes, animals do change their cholesterol levels in their blood. And by the way, you make cholesterol. You don't have to eat it at all. You can eat, not eat cholesterol at all, and you will make it. Okay? Uh, and my, to my understanding, as of the last articles I read, and I'm no doctor, so don't take my word for it, what, how much cholesterol you, you eat has very little impact Dietary cholesterol has very little impact on your cholesterol in your blood. The impact comes from saturated fatty acids. As we see, saturated fatty acids can make your lip membranes more stiff. So your membranes become more stiff with more, more less cholesterol, more fatty, uh, saturated fatty acids make your membranes stiffer. More unsaturated fatty acids, more cholesterol makes your membranes more fluid more space, right? So it's possible to be wrongly diagnosed with high cholesterol? No, it's a good question, unlikely. The difference, as I said, with humans, it's a little different. Our bodies don't change that much because we change our, we change our behavior to deal with that freezing problem. Other animals that don't have the ability to do that, they might grow thicker fur. You know, animals shed in the spring, in the summer. They shed because it's hot. Then they grow new for, for, winter, for the fall and winter. Does that make sense? We don't do any of that. So we change our, we, we have a brain that allows us to change. So can you get a misdiagnosis? Yes. Would it be because of that? No. Yes. No, no. Makes, makes blood less, makes the membrane more fluid, not thinking it doesn't thicken it. And thickening the blood, when we're talking about diabetes and increase in blood pressure, that's literally because sugar is polar, sugar is sticky, very sticky. It changes your blood, enough concentration will change your blood into something like syrup, which that's different. That's dissolved polar molecules that thicken your blood, make it more viscous because everything's sticking to itself. And that causes all kinds of problems. So yeah, diabetes is mainly a problem of sugar, which is a polar molecule, okay? Uh, saturated fatty acids will make the membrane more stiff, unsaturated, more fluid. Are we all good? Not that I, not that I understand, no. Uh, you should talk to your physicians, though. Don't be changing your diet based on what I say. I'm just a high school biology teacher, but my understanding is no. The, the problem comes, though, is that with things that are high in cholesterol are also tend to be high in saturated fats, and they tend to be high in trans fats. So like bacon, uh, high in cholesterol, also high in fats. One good thing that's uh, high in cholesterol but not high in saturated fats, eggs. You used to think eggs were bad for you. Today we, we're pretty sure, from what I've read, that eggs are good for you. So whether that changes when we learn more, I don't know. But that's my understanding thus far. All right. So are we all good with this? All right. So now 
That's prokaryotes. Interestingly, there's another group. Let's let's talk about some of the stuff you you had yesterday. Uh, there's two groups. There's three big domains. We call them domains of life. Three big ones. There's archaea. That's archaebac. That's a type of bacteria. And there's bacteria, or bacteria, I'm just going to call it bacteria. And then there's euka eukaryotes. I think it's Ada. Is it Ada? I think it's Ada. Eukaryota. Eukaryota, bacteriata. And archaea. These are three domains in life. These two are these two here are what we call prokaryotes. Which are the ones that we just described above. Okay? And we'll describe them better later, but bottom line, just one membrane. That's it. They might be they might be that shape, they might be round. They might be that shape with something called a flagella, which is an extension of that membrane, but it's just one membrane, no matter, regardless. Inside, inside these, you will have a circular. It's a double helix. Remember the, what the double helix in, in, uh, in, it's on your school crest, right? The double helix looks like this. In eukaryotes, there's an end. There's a five prime end and a three prime end. In Bacteria, there's no end, it's a circle, but there's still double helix. Did it freeze again? Oh, okay. So it's I don't I wouldn't be surprised. In I'm gonna draw two colors. So you see there's it's a double helix, but it's a circle. Do you see that? Yeah. Alright, so it's the same with all the various types of bacteria. They have a single chromosome that is circular in a double helix format, and that's how bacteria do their DNA. They also have smaller double helixes that are piece, smaller pieces of DNA that also wrap around each other in a double helix, and there could be, these things are called plasmids. We talked about that yesterday. Are we all good with that? It's time to go. Well, before we go, do I have time to write, just write out the rest of the organizations, just four or five titles? Is that okay? Yeah. All right, just really quickly. Eukaryota, you have, uh, in eukaryota, you have fungi. And we'll finish this tomorrow. Fungi, you have animals. Yeah, and the next one's plants. It's very good. Does anybody know what the last one is? There's six. So far, I only got five. The last one's what? You guys know from SpongeBob. Not Patrick. Patrick's an animal. Snails and animal. What? Squids and animal. Yeah. Sponges are animals. Good, good, good guess, though. Huh? Single cell. One eye. Plankton. Yeah. They are. They are protease. Plankton are protease. So these are the six kingdoms of life. These are these are the the six kingdoms. Archaea. Make sure you know them for the next test. Animals, fungi, bacteria, archaea, bacteria, plants, and proteins. All right, very good guys. Good job today. So in under fungi, there are there are these groups of of an of of life that you know of that you've seen in the That's a mushroom. A mushroom, correct. Badly drawn mushroom, but still. Oh you recorded it? He said that So mushrooms are fungi. So are these little things called yeast. We use yeast to bake bread. We use yeast to 
make beer. We use yeast uh, in a lot of things, and yeast can cause infections, yeast infections, and urinary tract infections, and then males and females. Huh? Yeast, same yeast. They're different strains. So yeast, yeah, they're yeast. Baker's yeast is different from the yeast that cause infections, but they're still fungi. They're still the same group. Yeast or yeast. There is mold. Mold is also, is also, I hope you're listening, and I know you're not. I not, am. Not you. So you have, could you, could you all back there, shh. you have yeast, and you have uh, mold, mold in the bathroom, this mostly single cellular, is also a fungi. Black mold is just mold. They're just all fungus. Uh, athlete's foot. It's a whole different. They're different kinds of. I mean, obviously, they're different kinds of yeast. Yeah. I mean, sorry, different kinds of uh, fungi. It's not. They're not all the same. And uh, you know, you know something called ringworm. Ringworm is not a worm. It's a fungal infection. Uh, dandruff. I can't spell dandruff. Somebody spelled it. It's the dandruff is the result of a fungus. Dandruff is caused by a fungus, at least some of the forms of dandruff. I can't. Whatever. I think it's UF. Uh, if your scalp is just dry and a little itchy, that's not the same as having dandruff. Dandruff is when you have a lot of dead skin and it's like that's a thick and it falls out. You could make it snow on your desk. Then it, it happens. It's a, light, it's a light fungal infection, easily cleared up with some dandruff shampoo. It's not a big deal. But it is, it is, in fact, a fungus. Now, you have, or at least it's caused by fungus, excuse me. Animals, I'm not even, I can't even go into it, but you know there's birds. There's birds, which are dinosaurs. I hope you know that by now. There are mammals. There's, uh, there's herbivores and carnivores in mammals as well. There are fish. There's sponges. And there's a lot, right? There's a lot of different animals. I'm not going to go into all of them. Each one has a different sort. Obviously, something like a squid and an octopus is different from a fish. So they each has their own way of doing things. But they're all animals. They have common characteristics to make them animals. We have plants. Yes, yeah, sponges, like SpongeBob. It's an actual animal. Did you not know that? No. Yeah, but it is. They actually do exist. In the ocean, yeah. <laughs> Say what? Yes. These will be on the test. Plants, plants obviously are things like grass and trees. There's a lot of conversations going on, but what are flowers, cacti, uh, seaweed? Uh, seaweed can be algae. Depends on where you, but seaweed, let's go with seaweed. Let's call it kelp. I think kelp is a plant. Yeah, kelp is a plant. Huh? Yeah. Did you try seaweed before? Yes, I love seaweed. I love seaweed. Yeah, it's, yeah, I eat it. They're all salty. They're from the ocean. So protease, protease are things like algae. Yeah, in a second. Algae. I just want to finish this before class is over. Algae, uh, no, barnacles are animals. Algae, uh, plankton. <coughs> plankton is real. Uh, Proteins are real. There are plankton that are animal-like. There are plankton that are plant-like. Some do photosynthesis. Some are multicellular. There are things like amoebas. There are there are uh, ciliates. Ciliates. 
So amoebas look like something like this. And they have, they have uh, amoebas go and surround and eat things. Ciliates, ciliates have little cilia on them. They have small mouths. They have multiple nuclei, that kind of thing. C ciliates, amoebas, plankton. Plankton does not, they don't have a single eye, but they actually do look a little like plankton, and they, they kind of look something like this. This this is not an eye, that is a nucleus. If 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 plankton were a real if the cartoon were drawn from a real plankton, it would be a nucleus. So some plankton have tails, they swim, others don't. So Yeah, they're so they so the plankton it all the things in SpongeBob are real, but obviously they're made up and exaggerated. The characters are made up. They were talking about a sponge, like from their kitchen. No, the sponge from your kitchen used to be uh, used to be sponges from the ocean. That yes. Everybody can They were animals. Sponges used to. Excuse me. Let me finish before you freak out. Sponges, sponges from the ocean used to be used as sponges in the kitchen. We no longer do that because we can make them synthetically. We don't need to collect them from the ocean the way we used to. They used to collect them, dry them out, and then they would be used, their bodies would be used as sponges. And you can go get, go get one. You can get them. You can, you can actually buy them on Amazon. Okay. Yeah. Look, you can buy almost anything on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, Venus flytrap is a plant. It does photosynthesis. It only captures flies and other insects in order to get nitrogen because they live in nitrogen depleted areas where they don't have a lot of nitrogen. Yes. Huh? I, I, I'm surprised that you have this idea. Let me be very clear. We used to use whale oil for, for our lanterns to light our, our streets. So that what is whale oil? We would collect the whale and they'd cut off the blubber. And they'd melt it into an oil liquid form and they would put that liquid oil into lamps and we'd burn them. That's how we kept ourselves warm. To write, our tools were made from bones of animals or the tusk of an elephant. Or we use feathers as quills. That's another example. But, say what? Why did they leave out stuff that you all Wait, I don't mean leave it. Wait, I'm trying to understand your question. Leave it out what? Why is this now? Lipstick today is not made of anything except wax and coloring. Uh, wax, wax used to be made of beeswax. We would raise bees. We then, at the end of the season, they would take the, the honeycomb, squeeze out the honey. That wax would get melted, and you could make them into candles. You could take that wax and make them into lipstick. That kind of thing. Today we have synthetic methods of making wax, so we don't have to depend on bees. Uh, maybe it was weighed out of whale, but I don't know. I don't know specifically. I know that waxy materials usually come from things like beeswax. You're sitting on a dead thing right now. Wait, beeswax like the tree? Woo! The tree. Yeah, the tree was dead. The tree was alive. You're, 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 you're sitting on its skeleton. Why is that funny? It was alive. And you killed it and cut it up. Somebody did. What? What? Why is that different? Because it can. Because because that. Because why is a tree different? It can't move, so it's okay. So if somebody's paralyzed, it's all right. No, I'm just saying that thing, a tree can't move. That doesn't make it any less alive. Now I'll grant you, it probably doesn't feel much, but it does sense pain. Trees do sense pain, they do react, they do communicate. So we know that with chemicals. If a, if a caterpillar is eating the leaves of one tree, they send signals to the neighboring trees, and those other trees react. 
through chemicals. They release chemicals through the air and through their roots. They react by producing poisons that kill caterpillars. So if they start at the at the tr in some cases, obviously, other cases they they might not produce as much uh, as many leaves, not produce as much fruit, whatever it is, it's going to reduce the infection. Yeah, it's interesting. They don't have brains, true, but they do, they are alive. They're very much alive. They're feeling, they react to the environment. They, uh, some people will report that plants react to music, soothing music versus, I don't know, I don't really know if I believe those reports, but, but that's what they used to say. So, but the point is, for sure, they react to the environment. They are alive. So just because they can't talk, uh, they can't move, doesn't make them any less alive. In fact, the fact that some of these trees are 300 years old, 1,000 years old, and we come down for wood, that makes it somehow a little more intense, doesn't it? It's like those, some of those trees were alive when Jesus was walking here. Do you, you ever think of that? Some of those redwoods were alive when Jesus was walking here, and we cut it down for trees, for wood. All right, guys, have a good day.